What's going on, everybody? Welcome to yet another episode of the Core Consult RX podcast. And Cole and I are happy to say that this is another ACPE accredited podcast. Thanks to our partnership with uh, our friends over at FreeCE.com. This episode is going to be worth one hour of continuing education credit. Uh, in the link will be in the show notes. So if you are a free CE member and you have an unlimited membership, then I do want to, there was some confusion about that in a couple other episodes. So it's if you have an unlimited membership with freece.com, then you can click on the link and it will take you to our post activity test, answer 10, uh, we'll say semi hard to eh, questions. And hopefully you'll blow right through those and uh, because you learned so much from this podcast and uh, get your credit um, that counts towards your, your license. Now, if you are not a member of FreeCE, then definitely check out their unlimited membership because they have all kinds of great options. So it's not just our podcast episodes, but they also have monographs and live events, all kinds of great stuff. Um, and if you use the, the code PODCAST2022 at checkout, you get 15% off the unlimited membership annual fee anyway. So definitely check that out. Uh, if you are um, doing the post-activity test, it's going to ask you for a password. The password for this episode is RISK, R-I-S-K, in all capital letters, and it will let you in to take your test, and you'll get your credit, is assuming you pass. So we are doing a topic tonight that I don't think we've done in the past, if maybe briefly mentioned, but not actually done a, a topic on. So Definitely never a full episode. Um, we're going to talk tonight about opportunistic infections. And uh, we'll talk about specifically, because there's obviously various disease states that can make someone immunocompromised, but we're going to focus primarily on HIV patients. And, you know, we'll talk about not just the risk factors and whatnot as far as the patient's immune um, immune function, but also uh, looking at the prophylaxis versus the actual treatment. If the patient gets infected with one of these, we'll look at that from both angles. And, um, yeah, hopefully this will be helpful for uh, those of you who have HIV patients either at your clinic or filling prescriptions at your pharmacy or what have you. But before we get into the meat of it, um, we're going to do our clinical pearl of the day, um, sponsored by our friends over at pearls.com. And we are basing this off of their chart dealing with drugs that can potentially cause hypoglycemia. And this is actually a good one for today because one of the medications we'll be talking about is Bactrim. And uh, Bactrim is an antibiotic that can potentially cause um, hypoglycemia. It's almost got like a sulfonylurea type mechanism um, that causes that insulin secretion. And if the patient's already on things like sulfonylureas or insulin or other drugs that are more prone to hypoglycemia, it can increase that risk. Some others to keep in mind would be uh, ciprofloxacin and the rest of the fluoroquinolones, um, some other antibiotics. Um, Pentanamide, which is one we're going to be talking about as well today. Uh, linazolid can also cause it. And chloroquine is another one. And uh, there's several others, everything from beta blockers to um, certain antiarrhythmics to um, all kinds of uh, potential agents to watch out for. So um, that's a nice chart on pearls.com. And if you haven't checked them out yet, it's a great app. You just go to www.pearlspyrls.com slash coreconsultrx. And you can sign up for free to use the um, – you get some free uh, PDF files and you get some access to various charts and whatnot. And then you can check out um, what other options he has uh, for the, the pro version. Um, but definitely a good app that uh, I've been using more and more. And the content keeps getting updated almost monthly. Um, so definitely check them out because they're supporting us. So support those that support us if you can. All right. Cole, we'll jump into this thing? Yeah. Let's jump into it. Um so, like you said, we're talking about opportunistic infections. Um, we'll give a little bit of background, and then we're, we'll talk about how to prevent it, because that's a big uh, piece of this, is prevention. And we'll talk uh, specifically about each individual one, some treatment pearls, what you'd usually start with in some special situations. Um, we'll touch on, you've probably heard of many of these infections, but uh, pneumocystis pneumonia, toxoplasmosis, uh, mycobacterium avium complex, histoplasmosis, uh, Cryptococcus neoformans, um, um, coxidoid mycosis. Don't know if I'm pronouncing all this right. Mac, Mac, yes, M A C. Couple other cool, yeah, some, um, some, some some tough names, but we're gonna do our best. You know, know. it's always our uh, our Achilles heel. It's our, pronouncing things. I'm just hoping that our infectious disease colleagues aren't listening to this one for the pronunciation. Or if you are, just be nice when you email us with the <laughs> correct pronunciation. <laughs> just correct, it's nice. Otherwise, it hurt our feelings. 
Um, so it's important before we get into all that to understand why these happen, right? So we talked about patients with HIV. Um, specifically, if we're thinking back to our immunology days, we're thinking of CD4 cells. Um, CD4 cells are T helper cells, um, uh, white blood cells that are an essential part of the immune system. You'll hear various names for them, um, T4 cells, T helper, T helper cells, CD4 cells. And they're called helper cells because they're one of their main roles is to send signals to other types of immune cells, like CD8 killer cells. Um, these are going to attack and destroy the infectious particle. Um, in um, situations like um, HIV and AIDS, um, the CD4 cell count is going to deplete. Uh, and as it depletes, uh, the patients are going to become more high risk for these, these infections, and that's why they're called opportunistic, because they're taking advantage of a compromised immune system. Um, HIV infection is one, um, but of course, any other immune suppression, like Mike said, um, transplants, for instance, where the body's left vulnerable, um, a wide range of these opportunistic infections can um, take advantage. And, and really, in a case of an HIV-infected patient, you know, if left untreated, they the CD4 count will continue continually decrease and their immune system obviously gets weaker and weaker and a lot of times that's kind of what ends up causing the patient to ultimately start getting complications and, and maybe pass away is these opportunistic infections starting to take over and then it just kind of spirals from there and you know when it comes to things like um, you know the actual way we think about preventing these infections the number one thing obviously is going to be able to uh, to start the patient on antiretroviral therapy, which is obviously the main focus of HIV uh, treatment. So if you get the patient on, on ART, then their CD4 count, as long as it's the right regimen and you know the patient's taking it as, as, as prescribed, the, the C4 count will start to increase back towards baseline, or at least you know moving towards that, and the viral load will decrease. So the patient's immune system will um, you know take care of its you know and get back to its 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 baseline of being able to actually protect the body. Um, and so it's definitely cut down because of our, our advances in ART. It's, it's cut down significantly on um, the basically the presence of opportunistic infections. However, in the case of a patient whose CD4 count is not controlled or maybe they've just recently become aware that they have HIV, so they weren't on, um, on ART therapy, then uh, basically you know, the, the prevention of these opportunistic infections is going to be really important for making sure that they can, can get back and uh, have a long and healthy life um, while the, the um, ART is having time to work. I mean, thinking back to the days before potent antiretroviral therapy, this was the primary cause for uh, mortality, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of stats. Yeah. So um, the reason that um, prevention is important or um, early quick initiation of antiretroviral therapy is important is because, for example, with uh, pneumocystis pneumonia, without any um, ART treatment or without antibiotic um, prophylaxis, if their CD4 count is below 100, um, there's a 40 to 50 percent risk per year of developing pneumocystis pneumonia, which would each individual case of that with the low CD4 count is going to be very severe. Um, toxoplasmosis, um, uh, 30 percent per year in that same situation. Um, MAC, 40 percent per year in that same situation. So if they aren't on targeted antiretroviral therapy, um, and, or do not have um, antimicrobial prophylaxis on board, then their risk is extremely high. And, you know, besides the actual recommended options based on the specific thing that you're trying to prevent um, when it comes to these opportunistic infections, there's other things that we don't think of as opportunistic necessarily. However, the patient, because in general they're, they're more immunocompromised, they would be potentially at risk for catching you know, that anyone could, um, could be infected with, you know, fairly commonly. So things like, you know, pneumonia, um, and, and hepatitis B. Um, and so it's important also to think vaccination as well, because while those aren't specifically op what we would classify as opportunistic infections, um, they are still going to be something the patient would be vulnerable to. So don't, we get, don't get caught up only on the, the classic opportunistic infections that we're going to kind of go through in a minute, but still our natural um, infections that we, we use vaccinations to prevent and even our healthy population, we still need to be considering in these as, really especially. Now, as far as when to vaccinate, um, you know, that may depend on the patient specific kind of parameters. So if the patient has 
um, you know, in a low CD4 count, they're immunocompromised pretty, you know, severely. Now, the immunization may not actually be all that beneficial, even if it's um, potentially safe for the patient if it's not a live vaccine or anything. Um, but, you know, it depends on how well, you know, you need to protect that patient, or how quickly you need to protect that patient. You may start them on ART, and then as their immune system starts to, to recover, then give them the vaccination at that point. Um, but that would be just kind of a patient-specific sort of, um, you know, parameter to consider. Yeah. Um, along with that and along with vaccination, avoiding exposure can be important. So there are certain opportunistic infections that we um, can kind of predict uh, occur in certain places so we can avoid them. One specific one that um, a lot of people are familiar with is toxoplasmosis. Um, the bug is called Toxoplasma gondii, um, and it uh, specifically you can get that from ingesting the oocytes, I believe it's called, um, and they can uh, are readily present in uh, cat feces, so you would want to avoid changing the cat litter. Um, so uh, in my case, I'm almost positive that I have uh, some toxoplasmosis floating around because I've had to change the cat litter a lot. So have you have you seen that, uh, that I, I guess you call it a theory, that um, it's, and I think it's more based on like re- just retrospectively looking mm-hmm. at it, but like certain patients that have, or not patients, but people who are more like um, like willing to take certain risks, in fact like CEOs or people who do like you know, certain sporting things like, like motorcycle racing or whatnot, um, are thought to have a much higher instance of toxoplasmosis, uh, infection. I have heard that like risk, risky behavior. Yeah. It leads to that. Weakly linked back to like a toxoplasmosis uh, colonization. Yeah. Cause apparently it like is something that, uh, cause I guess it's, it, it's involved with, it makes the rat, it gets infected with rats and mm-hmm. makes them uh, attracted to the like cat urine or mm-hmm. something which so it makes the rats just go like oh no that's not my predator that's like a dude i'm gonna go did you have cat, did you have cats growing up no see i did not either are you but you're, you would consider yourself a pretty yeah i risky would person. see i would not consider myself a very risky see, I have, person i have cobras downstairs yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but you know it's funny that it makes me think because when we first got our cat we have a cat now i was not a cat person but then, as time went on, I really love my cat. Like I'm, like my cat is fantastic. I would, it would be very sad for my cat to die. Mm-hmm. I wonder if the toxoplasmosis infection is making me have a greater affinity for my cat. It might. Now, if you start like really starting to like the smell of your cat's like litter <laughs> box, then I'm going to be a little bit more concerned. I don't think that's ever going to happen. But when when <laughs> my wife was uh, pregnant, I had to change you know the litter yeah. box the whole time. So I was not loving my cat at that. Point. Yeah. But. Yeah. Dogs instantly start barking. Ten minutes yeah. in the episode, they're gonna bark. They're barking at nothing as mercenaries come but yeah, in and get if, us. If you are at risk for opportunistic infections, avoid cat litter. And similarly, <laughs> undercooked meat it can be um, it can be present in undercooked meat as well. Um, so, do you want to get into kind of some um, times when we should be concerned about certain infections and that sort of thing? Yeah. So it's a lot of it's going to be based on CD4 counts. Um, and I will say for any CD4 count, uh, a lot of times patients will kind of get a tuberculosis screening. Um, and, you know, it, it may be uh, annually, um, but if the patient is, saw, is seen to have a um, latent infection, then we would treat, you know, as, as we would. You know, the treatment algorithm may change a little bit based on the patient's um, HIV status and whatnot, but um, consider screening for tuberculosis is the big one. Um, and that's for all CD4 counts. Now, when we get into specifics as far as you know, CD4 uh, levels, um, one of the first kind of cutoffs is if a patient who has a CD4 count of less than 250. Um, so coccidiomycosis is um, a fungal infection that we would um, need to potentially consider um, and you know treatment if, if obviously if they have a verified um, diagnosis but also in some cases we could look at doing um, a prophylactic type option if they're in an area that is more endemic um, so certain parts of California um, and uh, Arizona Texas New Mexico um, things like that uh, Mexico itself um, Central and South America in some areas um, those patients may be more at risk to getting it they would be the ones that if they did fit the criteria um, and and seemed like uh, candidates that we would prophylactically treat. Right, because um, it's endemic in those areas. Yes. And so um, so I guess it doesn't appear that we perform annual IgG and IgM serologic testing on everybody. We just kind of perform the testing on people who might live in one right. of those regions. 
and then yeah if we find something then we'll treat but um they they do the annual igg igm serologic screening like Cole said and um, from there you know the if, again if they if they find out that the patient does in fact have the infection um, and you know you go through the diagnostic criteria and all that. Um, at that point, there's a few different treatment options that are specifically recommend, recommended for immunocompromised hosts. And so, just to kind of touch on a few of this, because think when anytime you're thinking this coccidiomycosis, you're thinking um, fluconazole for most patients. Um, and so, patients who have HIV um, found to have this infection, you would initiate therapy with 400 milligrams of fluconazole daily. Um, they also have itraconazole twice daily as an option. However, there's some thought that the itraconazole is not absorbed as well in patients with HIV. Uh, and you, anytime you hear itraconazole, I mean, azoles in general, right? We're thinking drug-drug interactions, but itraconazole especially interacts with freaking everything. Um, and so it's something that uh, fluconazole is probably a better option in general just for safety parameters. Um, but, you know, 400 milligrams for mild to moderate disease is pretty standard. Um, severe disease, if they do not have any kind of like respiratory compromise, um, then we would bump it up from either 400 maybe to 800 milligrams of fluconazole daily. Um, and then, again, intraconazole is still a potential option. Um, and then if the patient has severe disease with respiratory compromise, in that case, so the you know, most severe cases, we would potentially consider amphotericin B. And then we would transition to fluconazole um, after they've been a little bit more stable. Um, and also, as far as um, how long to treat, too, were you, were you finished with that portion? Yeah, yeah, that portion, yeah. Yeah, as far as how long to treat, it kind of depends. Um, so if a patient, it, it, it depends on the clinical manifestation. So if a patient has focal pneumonia mm -hmm. and their CD4 count is less than 250, they need treatment for a minimum of three months. If they have diffuse pulmonary involvement or disseminated disease, they have to be treated for 12 months, for a full year. Um, so it can be uh, significantly long. Um, as far as discontinuing, um, they monitor for reoccurrence with clinical evaluation. They do chest radiographies um, and serologic testing uh, at 12-week intervals for at least a year um, to ensure that there's not a reinfection. And again, this is something that we're more concerned with patients in those endemic areas. Yeah. So I know we've, we've said we've both kind of addressed that, but just I don't want you to automatically jump into this one as everyone with HIV needs prevention or anything like that because um, not, not the case. So the next one? Yep. So the next cutoff is, it was 250 with that one, CD4 count less than 200, and that's pneumocystis pneumonia. It has a confusing name. Um, it's now called pneumocystis uroviche pneumonia, but still it's labeled as PCP uh, because the previous um, uh, name had a C. I think it was Carini or Carini mm -hmm. um, uh, in the middle of the name. So it might be called PCP pneumonia or um, pneumocystis pneumonia. Um, for this one, it's pretty common as well. Um, as far as um, treatment and prevention, so if, if, if you need to prevent it, so if a patient has CD4 count less than 200, the recommendation is Bactrim. Um, if patients cannot take Bactrim, then there are alternative agents like Dapsone, um, Atovaquone suspension, and also an aerosolized pentamidine. Um, you can do this, it, they can be discontinued uh, when antiretroviral results increase the CD4 count greater than 200 um, for more than three months. Then you can discontinue the, um, the uh, preventative antimicrobial. And what's the, one of the questions I get asked a lot um, from students and whatnot is, well, this is classified as a fungi. Why are we using Bactrim? Because um, why not? We, why wouldn't we use an azole or something like that? Um, this cell membrane of this lacks um, uh, ergosterol. So... We can't use an antifungal agent like an azole or amphotericin B. It's not going to be active against this. But the fungus needs to synthesize its own folic acid, uh, and so that ends up being our target of choice in this case. So we can use Bactrim because we're actually targeting the folate synthesis. So Bactrim is kind of that you know class of its own, so to speak. And so you know because of that aspect, that's why it's considered uh, the proper agent here, first line, whether you're treating or prevention. For that, you know, simple reason, it's the, it's the folate as the target, not the fact that it's a fungal or a bacterial organism. It's good clinical pearl. That's two. That's <laughs> Full two, of them. two pearls today. All right. So you said prevention, and you, um, 
did you go over any of this adverse effects? No. So if we, you know, I think that's important, even though that should be a review, but I think it's good to kind of touch on them. Um, the big one with Batrum, obviously, being potential rash. You know, some people have a, it's a, a, a sulfonamide allergy it tends to be, um, you know, one of the second most common allergies besides penicillin when it comes to antibiotics. Um, GI upset obviously can happen. Um, it can increase your potassium levels in some cases, usually not that you know, clinically, but in the case of, you know, a patient who's using this prophylactically, it may be a good idea to at least keep that in more, you know, more in mind if the patient's going to be on other medications, they could also increase potassium levels. Um, and then, you know, things like Dapsone um, for the alternative regimens, um, you know, that can cause in some patients who, if, especially if they have a, a G6PD deficiency, um, it can cause like uh, uh, hemolytic anemia, um, and so that's something that uh, you may want to get genetic testing for if the patient's never had that. Um, but again, like LFTs um, for for Dapsone and for Bactrim as well, um, be just based on the patient being on it potentially for a longer period of time than we would typically think um, can be important. Yeah. And so that's prevention. So then if we're going to have to diagnose somebody with PCP pneumonia, um, that would be through a um, sputum, an induced sputum, sputum or bronchoscopy specimen. Um, and if we were to diagnose them with PCP, then you get into more treatment doses of um, some of the drugs we talked about. So it depends on if they have mild disease, moderate disease, severe disease, um, the way that you determine that. It can be from an arterial blood gas, uh, but that's not always possible, especially if, if the patient isn't necessarily hospitalized. Um, so they do say that um, uh, you can get kind of a preliminary classification with um, O2 sat, uh, and you can also kind of use that to guide um, if you need corticosteroids on board or not. Uh, so if it's a mild to moderate disease, um, arterial blood gas, um, uh, O2 greater than 70 um, uh, on room air, then you can do Bactrim oral. Uh, if it's severe disease, then you would have to probably be hospitalized or yes, be hospitalized and get um, IV Bactrim in that instance. Um, some of the alternatives are similar to the alternative preventative agents we have. Uh, I mentioned pentamidine um, in uh, severe disease, also primaquine plus clindamycin in severe disease. Uh, in mild to moderate disease, you could do dapsone, primaquine, or atovaquone. Um, Bactrim's preferred, but there might be instances where there is a severe allergy. Um, if it's uh, deemed to not be an anaphylactic severe allergy, then they might um, test with Bactrim to see how they respond before moving on to one of the alternatives. And, and uh, also, so it's, and I don't know if you may have said this cool, but I didn't hear it, but the, with the moderate, mild to moderate, if you're going to use Dabson, it's in combination with trimethoprim. No, I didn't say as that. Well. Yeah, yeah, that's so um, that's the, that's where obviously you're, if you ever noticed that there is available options for trimethoprim by itself without the sulfamethoxazole, um, that's one of those cases where you would actually utilize something like that. Um, so yeah, Dabson and, and trimethoprim together is three times daily. Well, trimethoprim is three times daily, the Dabson's once daily. Yep. Um, and then, you know, some, we already talked about Dapsone and Bactrim as far as complications, but, um, the, uh, Pentamidine, pentamidine. Um, the other thing to consider with that one in particular is it could potentially cause pancreatitis. So if a patient has other risk factors for that, um, you want to keep that in mind. And that can also cause electrolyte and glucose abnormalities as well um, and cardiac dysrhythmias. So um, that would be one that, you know, at least make sure you have a very solid uh, patient history so that you're kind of aware of, um, you know, what uh, what's potentially a, a risk factor for that particular patient. Yeah. Um, also, some special populations, if they're pregnant, um, Bactrim is um, preferred, but you can also use the Dapsone uh, plus trimethoprim option. Um, some patients, I mentioned the corticosteroids, but they might require adjunctive corticosteroid treatment. Um, generally, this is reserved for patients who have severe disease. Like I said, you can get that from um, a um, arterial blood gas, but also if you have a good um, pulse ox, uh, I think it's less than 92% uh, room air. That would indicate um, a corticosteroid um, taper, which generally they'll just do a, a prednisone, 40 milligrams, uh, twice a day for five days, and then taper for three more weeks um, to aid with the um, inflammation and, and uh, breathing issues. All right. Anything else with with that? That's all I got. So histoplasmosis? Yeah. Um, so for histoplasmosis, now this is one that I feel like when I was in school, I learned uh, prophylaxis, itraconazole, 
um, is what we kind of typically think of. Uh, this, if you look at some of the resources now, including like the up-to-date author, um, authors and um, certain other uh, you know, clinical opinions, um, they recommend actually not administering antifungal prophylaxis in this case. So with itraconazole, um, the data it seems to be kind of limited as far as the true efficacy of prophylaxis. Um, and then, you know, if, once their immune system is recovered, especially obviously on ART, that's not something we're worried about. It. Now, if it's a hyper endemic um, area that the patient's living in, so basically if there's greater than 10 cases per 100 patient years. Um, in that case, the, the, those parts of like South America, you know, certain areas there, you know, they may consider itraconazole 200 milligrams daily um, if the patient's CD4 count falls below 150 or is 150 or below. Um, and then those patients, once the CD4 count recovers above 150, they can go ahead and stop. Um, you know, it, as long as that one that count of 150 has been uh, above that threshold for more than six months after they've been initiated on ART. So if you start, if they're in one of those hyperendemic areas, you catch, you know, first start treating them when they're below that 150, you may have to have them on six months of itraconazole, which is not ideal. That's a lot. Definitely, uh, it throws a, a wrench into the potential drug-drug interactions. And, oh, it's uh, huge for interactions. Yeah, it's the worst. Yeah. Um, did you mention amphotericin B? No. So there are instances where um, liposomal amphotericin B uh, may need to be used. So this would be patients with severe progressive disseminated histoplasmosis. This would be like an, an active um, infection uh, that, that required treatment. Um, so they would need induction with amphotericin B and then a maintenance therapy um, to prevent relapse. Itraconazole would probably be the maintenance therapy there. Um, it's also important when you're initially diagnosing it to differentiate it from tuberculosis and um, pneumocystis pneumonia. Um, primary way is to look for the detection of the histoplasma antigen to make sure that it is histoplasmosis. Good deal. Let's move on. If say, let's say the patient CD4 count is less or equal to or less than 100. Yep. Eesh. Toxoplasma? Yeah. You uh, you want that one? You want me to jump into it? Yeah. So um, with toxoplasmosis, we mentioned the bug a little bit already. Uh, but in general, we're going to administer suppressive therapy with um, Bactrim um, to prevent reactivation of the toxoplasma gondii. Um, so this, is, like Mike said, is for patients with a CD4 count less than 100 um, and a positive toxoplasma gondii IgG serology. Um, if they have a contraindication to Bactrim, similar to what we previously talked about, um, Dapsone can be used plus um, pyrethamine um, and leucovorin can be used as well. Um, if the patient is intolerant to any of these, they have an allergic reaction to either of these, atovaquone can be used uh, with or without pyrimethamine and leucovorin. Um, but monotherapy with dapsone, pyrimethamine, uh, azithromycin, or chlorothromycin should not be used. They recommend a combo therapy. Um, if a patient has antiretroviral therapy, they discontinue the suppressive therapy when the CD4 count is greater than 200 uh, for at least three months, and then you can discontinue the antimicrobial. I could be wrong about this, and we'll have to go back and listen. I, I want to say you might, you may have said oh, site is what they come, is what they mm -hmm. are found in. Oh, cyst. Cyst. Oh, site being the uh, from the ovaries. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's what I thought when I was saying it, and I was like, and, that doesn't and, sound exactly correct. As you said, I was like, I, I don't think I heard him right. I'm glad. But you, now that I read it now, I'm just like, I bet you, you did say. Oh, I'm <laughs> glad we corrected the record because that's exactly what I said. We got we, so so those of you who already had a note to email us, I appreciate <laughs> it. We got it. So we got another one for TikTok. Oh, oh sis. <laughs> How many words can there be that start with two O's? I don't know. We at least two. Multiple apparently. <laughs> at least two. Ooze. Does that have two O's? Ooze? Yeah, probably, right? Oh, yeah. O-O-Z-E? Yeah. I don't know if that's a oh, real word. No, that is. It like, sounds more like a Power Rangers type well, like a, a <laughs> word. Thick green ooze? Yeah. Something's oozing? Yeah, yeah that's oh, true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See? Yeah. Look at that. You're Book? Right. Technically, that has two O's. Okay. <laughs> starts, with, starts with two O's. Oh, there's so many options. We'll, we'll limit it to that. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, geez. Fantastic. Um, no, I forgot to tell I forgot what we were talking about. Oh, yeah. An opportunistic infection. <laughs> Um, anything else with Toxo? Um, no, I think I already mentioned that, um, in patients who don't have, um, prophylaxis and their CD4 count is less than a hundred, then, um, about 30% uh, a chance per year that somebody would reactivate toxoplasmosis and have an infection. Yeah. All right. So 
Um, let's talk. The other one to worry when you get to that 100 or less threshold is Cryptococcus. Um, and so this is another one that can potentially be, um, when it, from a prophylactic standpoint, um, can be kind of limited just because the the options are going to be you know high with drug drug interactions, adverse effects. Um, the other th- thing is that we I don't think we've really mentioned is one the cost and also two um, the antifungal drug resistance rates because we also don't want to just like we always think of antimicrobial stewardship. Um, we don't ever see they talk about the the, the antifungal stewardship teams because I don't think they exist but um they uh they, somebody has to have one of those right or do they just lump them into antimicrobial mm, I'm sure somebody has one yeah we should start our own if we don't the uh the but, core consult one the one for yeah, core consult we'll have zero customers <laughs> but um the uh, antifungal drug resistance can also become a problem um the other thing with cryptococcus is the in, any kind of like uh basically you know prophylaxis is lacked that overall survival benefit in the data. And so um, it's one of those things that uh, we don't always um, are, are going after prophylactically. However, if the patient C4 count is less than 100, like we said, um, and if they, uh, you know, are patients who are in resource limiting settings, um, screening for the serial cryptococcal antigen and um, preemptive therapy, um, if they test positive, may be useful um, to prevent symptomatic infections. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a more complex situation. Um, you know, it's, it is something that worldwide is, is more prevalent. There's um, 220,000 cases of cryptococcal meningitis um, each year, and um, nearly all of those are in patients with HIV. So um, the greatest number of cases, though, are from like sub-Saharan Africa as well as the uh, Asia and um, Pacific area. Um, it can potentially happen in uh, non-HIV patients as well, but um, like obviously from based on the data, a lot of HIV patients are more prone to come into contact with it. Yeah. Um, so getting a diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis specifically, you know, we're thinking along the lines of a, um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid sample, uh, and then getting a fungal culture that yields growth. Um, and then also seeing a cryptococcal antigen, um, positive sample as well. Um, some supportive diagnosis of the blood culture or, um, or uh, serum as cryptococcal, ant- cryptococcal antigen positive, um, that's really what may lead you to doing the lumbar puncture in the first place to actually get the um, cerebral spinal fluid sample. But uh, the blood the blood culture um, is is probably the starting point and can obviously support your diagnosis if you do find what you think you might in the spinal fluid. Right. Um, from a you know basically other uh, other st- you know lab standpoint, um, you may see some like focal neurological findings. Um, and, uh, you know, you might want to do a CT imaging even before you do the lumbar puncture. Um, some of the chemistries, you might see protein elevation or um, glucose could be normal or even low. So if patient's having hypoglycemia for, you know, a seemingly unbeknownst to reason, that may be another indicator. Um, and then uh, you can also you know, do some other random things as well. But um, getting, obviously, a patient history and CD4 count is important. If you find a patient who is positive, um, there's sort of like these three phases of antifungal therapy. Um, we have induction therapy, um, which uh, preferably we would use uh, amphotericin B, and we would want to use one of the polyene formulations of the liposomal um, or the amphotericin B lipid complex. Um, they have the um, deoxycholate amphotericin B, but obviously it's going to be associated with much more toxicities, um, so you got to be careful with that. And then in this case, um, to the amphotericin B, we want to add uh, flucytosine. So that's one of those drugs that you don't see really used as monotherapy. It's mostly used as an adjunct to kind of um, increase the efficacy of the overall um, situation, but um, flucytosine would be a good add-on to that. Um, and then if basically the, the duration of the amphotericin use has to be extended by as much as four to six weeks if you're not going to use flucytosine. So that's a good one to have on board. Um, and then they also, in some cases, will add on fluconazole as well. Um, but the fluconazole is uh, um, instead of you know flucytosine, but um, fluconazole has a higher incidence of failure rates. So not ideal. Right. Um, consolidation. 
is where at least eight weeks after, uh, so you begin this after two weeks induction treatment, plus you get a negative lumbar puncture culture. Um, and then this is going to be an eight week period where you're treating with most likely fluconazole, either IV or PO. Um, you have itraconazole as a backup if you needed it, but again, you have to monitor levels in this case and watch out for all the other potential interactions. Um, and then at that point, you move from consolidation into maintenance, and um, the preferred option is 200 milligrams of fluconazole daily. Uh, and then you have to treat for at least 12 months um, in an HIV patient, and the CD4 count has to be above 100, um, as well as having the HIV being controlled for at least the three months during that time um, to ensure that uh, the patient can then stop therapy after that. Um, there's also, besides itraconazole, for, you know, there's also voriconazole and posiconazole. Um, however, those are the you know, ones that cover more broad spectrum. And so if you can get away with not using those, um, it would probably be better options, again, just to not induce resistance. And we want to save those for our aspergillus and other types of fungal infections. Yep. Um, anything else with that one you want to talk about? I was going to say that... Um... So in patients who have a CD4 count less than 50, um, they are at risk for severe cryptococcal um, meningioencephalitis, uh, which is, like it says, is extremely severe. And if left untreated, is uniformly fatal uh, within about two weeks. So it can be a big deal, especially um, if it is not appropriately treated. Uh, another infection that we are concerned about when we get down to the CD4 count less than 50, um, which I think is the last one, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, we've um, referenced, which is MAC, Mycobacterium avium complex. Last one that we're going to talk about anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's others, right? Um, but for um, patients who are starting antiretroviral therapy, um, usually we don't um, prophylax them with antimicrobials. Um, previously, before there was good targeted antiretroviral therapy, um, it was common practice for all patients to uh, have uh, antimicrobials on board, macrolides specifically, with a CD4 count less than 50. Um, but it does, especially with um, antiretrovirals, it doesn't seem that it's necessary. Outcomes didn't really differ um, between patients who did or didn't receive prophylaxis as long as they're on antiretroviral therapy. Um, so in general, it's not um, necessary unless we get a um, confirmed diagnosis. Um, so if we do get a confirmed diagnosis, um, I will say that as far as uh, MAC itself, um, the bug, uh, it refers to infections caused by one of two non-tuberculosis mycobacterial species, right? Um, avium and intracellular. Um, most commonly, it's going to be um, AIDS patients and patients with uh, a C4 count less than 50. But these organisms are all over the place, pretty much ubiquitous in the environment. Uh, water, soil, um, and infection usually occurs through inhalation. So if a patient has this infection and they're hospitalized, um, they don't have to isolate because person-to-person -person transmission is not very common at all. Um, it, it's pretty, uh, pretty all over the place uh, in general. The um, two principal forms, it can be disseminated um, throughout the body, which can be more severe, or it can be localized. Um, um, the diagnosis is confirmed by um, uh, blood uh, culture of um, the mycobacterium uh, uh, species, and treatment is generally a macrolide in combination with ethambutol. Macrolides specifically clorithromycin or azithromycin, um, and they do recommend um, combination therapy um, pretty much exclusively. Um, they've looked at monotherapy before, and the resistance rates are significantly higher in patients who have monotherapy instead of uh, combination therapy. Um, yeah, clorithromycin or azithromycin plus ethambutol uh, is definitely the, the first-line option. Have you seen where they are also talking about the addition of uh, rifibutin, 300 milligrams once daily? Yes, um, there can be situations where they can do that. So it says there's um, conflicting data, but uh, it's one of those things that it may potentially improve survival. Um, and the other potential benefit of it was the decreased risk of macrolide resistance, which we know obviously is already a big deal. So that would be something that we would potentially – um, consider adding, especially if the CD4 count is you know less than 50, they have a high mycobacterial load to begin with, and then um, and especially in cases where there's an absence of effective ART. Right. Um, however, the thing to consider at that point is if you are going to use rifibutin, there's drug interactions with protease inhibitors, which if the patient doesn't have access to ART to begin with, you know if you're using protease inhibitors, uh, it may be you know more commonly in that area um, than 
the, you know, so the nukes aren't available like we would typically use protease inhibitors being another potential treatment option, lots of drug-drug interactions with those, as well as our non-nukes. Um, so that can be an issue. And then itraconazole, depending on if they're being treated for something else, um, prophylactically, that can also be an issue. So right. keep that in mind. Um, rifabutin is not a, uh, a simple med either. No. Now, if a third med is needed and rifabutin can't be used, fluoroquinolones or parenteral aminoglycosides can be used. But like Mike said, you, you're maybe thinking third agent in instances where they're failing antiretroviral uh, therapy. Um, it and also it, actually it affects the clothromycin uh like interact, it interacts with clothromycin itself right. as well, <laughs> right? And that's and that's a good point. So a lot of times, clothromycin is the first line. Um, that comes from some old data where they were head to head, kind of previously before antiretroviral therapy came about. Um, they haven't really gone head to head since it came about. So um, a lot of people will just use them interchangeably. Um, but especially considering clothromycin has a lot more drug interactions, if that's a concern, just use azithromycin. Yeah. And then uh, the, with clothromycin, just to mention this drug-drug interaction, if the patient's on any drug like a tripla that has efavirenz in it um, to suppress their HIV viral load, um, so hopefully they're on better drugs like Bictarvi and things now, but you know, let's just say they are on a tripla, the uh, clothromycin plus efavirenz can lead to much higher rates of uh, rash occurrence um, is one noted interaction, just to keep that in mind. The uh, I think the there was a one patient in our clinic that was being treated for MAC. Um, specifically, we ended up having to use azithromycin because clothromycin interacted with other of the meds. It's one of the first times I've seen azithro 600 milligram tablets. <laughs> I was like, and they said something about it. It was like when I first got to the clinic and um, when I first started working there and the infectious disease doc was like, yeah, yeah, have your uh, clinical pharmacist help you come up with the regimen. I was like, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> me for today? Yeah. So, uh, did you, stopping rules, like when to go over? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, treatment can be stopped in asymptomatic patients um, who have been on treatment for greater than 12 months of therapy, as long as their CD4 count is above 100 um, for the last six months. Um, so, at that point, then we can stop treatment. Again, it's a long time to be on therapy to begin with, but... Uh, and if the patient were to stop their, you know, ART or, or what something would happen and their viral load started to go back up, CD4 count falls back below 100, um, we probably need to go ahead and restart. Um, or if the patient during therapy, their CD4 count drops, we're going to restart therapy as well. So even if they haven't gotten to the point where they've stopped it completely. Right. Um, there are situations where um, – if it's if we're really worried about you know drug drug interactions things like that, um, or if there's areas where it's like really high resistance rates to the macrolides things like that, um, which does does happen and, and ideally we would want to get susceptibility testing you know to make sure that it is active against macrolides, um, but you can potentially use a fluoroquinolone, um, moxie, levo, and ciprofloxacin are the potential options, or you could uh, um, use that and and or uh, aminoglycoside specifically amikacin and streptomycin are the two potential options there that you could use as alternatives, um, you know that drug resistance resistant disease. Primary prophylaxis? Yeah. Um, CD4 count less than 50. Obviously, we want to rule out um, the fact that they do not have disseminated MAC before we start prophylactically treating them because that would be silly. And uh, the preferred option is azithromycin 1,200 milligrams. It's a lot. But only weekly. So it's not as much. Right. 600 um, milligrams twice weekly or clorithromycin 500 milligrams twice weekly. Um, if you... Or, you know, want to go with the rifibutinin route, which I don't, you know, advise necessarily, but that's once daily, 300 milligrams. And then, uh, you know, the combo therapy in, in the prophylaxis case is, is not advised um, just because of the greater increased risk of um, toxicity, adverse effects, right. interactions, all that good stuff. Right. Um, once the ART has been started and their patient's responding, the CD4 count goes back above 100, um, then the, you want to make sure that it stays above 100 for three months or more, and then you can go ahead and cut out the prophylaxis treatment. Cool? Cool. Anything else with that? No. I think we covered it all. 
Well, I don't know about all. <laughs> we covered some. <laughs> we covered enough in an hour. <laughs> we, we gave an overview. But um, yeah, so uh, I hope that was somewhat helpful. I think we're finishing up a little bit early today. That's okay. I'll give you guys a break because I think the last one went about five minutes over. So just listen to both of them and it'll, it'll balance out. <laughs> but uh, um, I hope that was helpful. If you guys have any questions, send us an email. Um, again, uh, to claim credit, make sure you follow the show notes and um, – or the, in the link in the show notes, rather, and then use the password uh, RISK, all capital letters. And just to reiterate, it is for the unlimited membership. Um, I get, I think I got a couple emails slash texts um, that were some people that were a little confused about why they couldn't see it uh, to, to pay for them individually. Um, maybe we can make something like that happen eventually, but uh, you know, we'll we'll see. But for now, it's it's only available as a um, according to the unlimited membership. Uh, what is it? Members, mm-hmm. Mem- unlimited membership members. <laughs> um, but yeah, big thanks to, to freece, um, dot com for continuing to partner with us. And, uh, we've had a lot of fun doing these for, uh, you know, the continuing education credit. It's definitely never something we anticipated doing. Uh, when we first started this podcast, if you told us when we first started, when we had our little rinky dink <laughs> microphone that we were sharing, um, we would have probably laughed. So, um, for those of you who've been sticking with us, we really appreciate it. If we can do anything to improve the show, definitely let us know. Um, we're, we have some, some guests lined up um, coming up, so we'll try to make some interesting topics with some much better experts than, uh, than us. But uh, if you guys have any topics in mind you want us to cover, definitely send us an email. Um, reach out to us on social media. And uh, if you want to check out our Patreon account, um, that's more like traditional lectures with PowerPoints and all that good stuff. Um, that's $3 a month, and uh, you can get access to hundreds of lectures. Uh, if you want to send us a text directly to get in contact with us, you can text 415-943-6116, and uh, then we'll get back to you as quick as we can. I, it won't be instantly. Um, the automatic message that goes that comes back, I had one person reply, no thanks. <laughs> what it said, because it says you want to add yourself to my phone book mm-hmm. and all that stuff. It says, no thanks. I just like my question. <laughs> I was dying. <laughs> I was like, yes, I hate this. I love it. <laughs> so um, I, we'll get back to you as quick as we can. If you want to ignore the automated message, by all means. Um, but thank you guys so much. We'll catch you guys in the next episode. Have a great night.